everyone, welcome. Yeah. We are gonna let everyone get logged in here. Um, and in the meantime, we would love to hear where everyone's tuning in from today. Um, I am coming at you from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, some of our panelists we've got from Denver, we've got Arlington, Virginia, Long Island, New York. Um, so we'd love to, to hear from you all. Hello from Queens. Oh. All right. Let's see. Got Christine from Cleveland. Hello to Maria in Chicago. Got California. We've got coast to coast here today. Love to see it. Great. And for everyone who's just joining, we're just going to give everyone a few minutes here to get dialed in. Um, and welcome to today's webinar. All right. Great. We've got Washington State. Hello to everyone in Michigan. Snowy Canada. Oh my goodness. I can't believe you're having snow. I'm sitting here in a sleeveless top. All right. Wonderful. Snow in Michigan today too. Wow. Crazy spring indeed. <laughs> That is so wild. All right, great. So we are at 12.02. So I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off today. Um, so welcome to everyone and thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Courtney Barrett. I'm a brand strategy manager here at Fairy Godboss. Um, for those of you who may be new to Fairy Godboss, we are the largest career community for women. Um, our mission is to improve the workplace for women by increasing transparency. Um, so we offer a variety of free resources for women. Um, so everything from anonymous company reviews, we've got job postings, articles, uh, virtual recruiting events, and more um, to really help empower and help women succeed in their career. Um, so before we think, get things started today, I wanted to let everyone know that we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar today. So feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can either submit your questions anonymously or using your name. Um, this webinar is also going to be recorded, um, so we'll be sending it out as a follow-up. Uh, so if you need to take a break, uh, we will be sending that back if you want to rewatch anything that you may have missed. So with that, I would love to start out by first thanking Accenture for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, we do have uh, Jacqueline Fitch from Accenture joining us today. So big shout out to the Accenture team. Um, so today's webinar is our next installment of our career conversation series. Um, and this particular webinar today um, is titled Balancing uh, Your Career and Multi-Generational Caregiving. Um, so with that, I am gonna go ahead and introduce our moderator who is Lisa Robasca Ropi. Um, Lisa is a freelance writer. Um, so she you know, covers all sorts of topics, um, big focuses on things like gender equality, um, as well as empowering women. So with that, I am gonna go ahead and pass it over to Lisa. And again, uh, welcome everyone. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm glad that you could join us. I have to tell you that um, when they asked me to moderate, I thought, well, this is perfect because I am actually living the sandwich generation right now. I am actually doing this meeting from my parents' guest room. I'm, I live in New Jersey, I live in um, Virginia and they live in New Jersey and I'm helping them pack their house so that they could come and move closer to me a 15 minute walk from my house in Arlington, Virginia. And then a week after they move, I have to go to Colorado, shout out to my panelists that are in Colorado to help my daughter pack up her dorm room and move back home after her freshman year of college. So I totally understand what it means to be in the sandwich generation. And I think a lot of our panelists do too. And I think they're gonna have some great tips for you, some resources. I know I'm looking forward to learning some new tips and tricks. So how about if we go around the room, the Zoom room and have everyone introduce themselves Tell me, tell everyone a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your background, what you're currently working on, um, anything that you're excited about, about today or this week or this month. Um, and let's, I'm just gonna go in the order that you're all on my screen. So Barbara and 
Um, Guadalupe, why don't you take it over? Guadalupe, sorry. Um, why don't you take it from here? Yes, no, um, we want to welcome all of you all. We're so thrilled to be a part of this and with such a really delightful panel of other women that are killing it after 40 and 50. And so we are with, we're the co-founders of Second Act Women. And we created this company because quite simply, we couldn't get hired. And so we are an organization, a social enterprise where we are providing development programs, uh, online tools, meetups, and things like that, all with the idea of helping our ladies over 40 and 50 reimagine and move on their futures. Uh, I think throughout the conversation that we're going to have today, many of you will be able to relate to you know, the imposter syndrome, the lack of confidence, the feeling invisible versus feeling invincible, and all of those ideas that suddenly, or no, sadly, uh, corporate America and society as a whole has placed on us as Gen X badass women. And so I come from the mall industry. I also dabbled in, well, not dabbled, it was eight years, in media as well, media sales. But mall industry was my, uh, my love. And um, I was a successful internationally known uh, or recognized award-winning marketing director. There is an award in mall marketing. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I'm here in Denver and uh, that's a little bit about me. And we'll, you'll learn more about uh, what happened and how our company came to be yes. uh, besides not getting hired. <laughs> Uh, and my name is Guadalupe Hurt, and I am the, the other half of Second Act Women. Oh, your wife. Yes. Um, thrilled to be here. So, and, and talking to all of you. Um, so, my background is in public relations. I have about 25 years of experience in PR. And um, after a, a great career in that, I moved into becoming an associate producer on a short subject documentary that looked at identity and culture created a workbook for high schools to work through those internal external issues. Um, and then co-founded two companies with my partner here. I'm a four-time entrepreneur, um, part of that sandwich generation and excited to talk a little bit about, just like you, Lisa, my own journey right now with my mom um, as we move her into my sister's house. So thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. Um, Jackie, do you want to go next? Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're working on. Sure. Hi, ladies, and thank you for being part of today. We're so excited to be here with you. My name is Jackie Gadeen. I am the co-founder of an organization called The Resting Mind with my co-founder and business partner, Mimi Bishop, who's also on this call. We really want to empower Gen X women. We find that they get into mid-career and they wake up and they think, my goodness, is this it? And we want them to wake up and say, this is it. And we want to help them understand how to know and own and articulate and negotiate their worth. They get to this point where their confidence is a little hindered or swaying and we want them to step boldly and bravely into who they are. So everything that Mimi and I do is from that lens. So we coach women through their career and to accelerate their career. So we work with a lot of high achieving women in that process. And then we also help them if they are looking to build their business. So we do a lot of that tactical stuff. As, as just like Barbara and Guadalupe say, a lot of women are like, this is not where I wanna play anymore. I don't want to work in corporate America. I wanna step off, do my own thing. I don't want to follow those rules because those rules aren't really benefiting me anymore. And so we help them actually build that business from the ground, from foundation to profitable. Um, I'm Jackie and I'm happy to pass the mic. Well, why don't we pass it to Mimi? Had to unmute myself. I am Mimi Bishop. I am thrilled to be here. And Jackie said so much about what we do at The Resting Mind. We, are, you know, at the end of the day, our goal is really to let Generation X women know that there is so much possibility for them still. And we coach them and work with them to really maximize that possibility, whether it be through continuing up-leveling their careers or making those pivots in their careers or stepping off and starting a business, which is exactly what Jackie and I did. I have a former corporate background. I was vice president of marketing at 
the division of News Corporation. I just realized that Lisa's cousin was my boss at one point, <laughs> which is a fun fact. And at the same time, you know, as we are moving into what's really next for us and all this unlimited possibility, we have other responsibilities, kids and parents. I am recording from the bedroom, my childhood bedroom, because I have moved in with my mom and dad while I helped my dad navigate through a health crisis. And right before I got on this call, I was helping him put on his slippers. It's like the real thing. So we are here to tell you that even if you are dealing with these kinds of challenges, there is still room for you to lean into what your possibility is. So I am thrilled to be here and be a part of this conversation. Jacqueline, why don't you um, go next? Great. Well, hello, everyone. I'm also very excited to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored to be here amongst all these women uh, who come from such different backgrounds and uh, have their own achievements uh, to talk through. So uh, I'm a mom of three young daughters. Uh, they're four, six, and nine. And I've been at Accenture about seven years. I've had three different careers within Accenture, uh, from consulting to now workplace. I support all of our offices, facilities, and employees in the West. And, you know, supporting people to be their best is my passion. That's, that's what I love to do. So uh, my, my side gig, if you will, um, I'm the lead for our North America Parents Network, which supports over 2,500 parents, caregivers, and allies at this point, uh, especially in the last year. Uh, our group has never been kind of so in need to get people the support that they need when they need it for whatever situation they might be in. Um, so I, I'm currently working on, you know, I'm just every day I get the opportunity to engage with our parents and caregivers and just help them figure out kind of what they need at this time, uh, sharing ideas and resources and benefits and helping them, uh, you know, through whatever situation they're in. So uh, I'm really happy to be here uh, representing Accenture and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to talk through some of the things that, that we've done and uh, some of the things that we found to be really successful from a company's perspective as well. So thanks for having me. And um, Yishuan, did I pronounce that right? <laughs> Spot on. Hi, everyone. I'm Yishuan Godfrey, CEO and co-founder of Apiary. We are a curated childcare platform helping parents find, book, and match vetted and experienced night nannies, babysitters, and enrichment leaders in minutes. We specialize in part-time, short-term, and occasional help because it is the hardest type of help to find. And like many of you, I'm a mom, wife, daughter, friend, whose own personal struggles of managing what we call the messy middle of life has really inspired us to reimagine what the future of living should look like. So I'm really excited to be here and thanks for having me. Sorry about that. Thank you all for being here. Um, I have some questions that I'm gonna ask, but I want the audience to know that if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A because there will definitely be time for your questions. And while I'm trying to keep track of both the chat and the Q&A, if you want your question answered, it's probably best if you put it in the Q&A. So I'm gonna start out with um, a question for Jacqueline. As we just heard, many of us are balancing our family lives. We're balancing raising children, taking care of older parents taking care of ourselves. And we're also trying to manage our careers and have meaningful careers. So I was hoping you can talk a little bit about how you're finding balance right now. What's working for you? And what do you think some of, what do you think some of the things you're doing might be able to help some of the rest of us? Yeah, I recently learned about a term, uh, work-life sway. And, and I find that I like that much better than work-life balance because it really resonates in the fact that there's no one solution for everyone or even for me every day, uh, right? What, what works for me one day is totally different than what works for me the next. So, you know, what's worked for me is setting a plan, but flexing, uh, having open communication often with everyone in your village, right? Wh whoever that might be, uh, whatever type of support they might provide you, um, you know, sticking to boundaries as much as you can, prioritizing what those boundaries are. So, you know, whether it's blocking off time in your calendar. So my partner and I, uh, you know, we each share throughout the day in supporting our two oldest daughters in virtual school. 
and we flex our time. So today's event is normally a time that I'm, you know, helping the kids and he's flexing and he's covering right now. And tomorrow he's got a big meeting and I'm covering, right? So it's just flexing, give and take, talking a lot and over again and over again, you know, finding those tools like shared calendars, things that can help you um, just stay aware. And, and then again, just giving yourself uh, you know, that, that pat on the back to say, you're doing it, you're getting through, take every day at a time and, and really lean on your village. So those, that's what's working for me. Um, Mimi, would you like to answer that as well? Do you need me to repeat the question or? No, no. So one of the things that we have heard so much as Generation X women is that we can do it all, right? And so, so many of us have just really believed that until we find ourselves cracking. And so Jackie and I, we don't believe that. And what we talk about is how you really need to prioritize. Like well, you can have it all, just not at all at the same time. So get very clear on what's important to you right now in this stage of your life and focus just on that. And you have to be a piece of that. So for me right now, I'll just give you a very personal example. It's our business is a huge priority. My parents are another priority because this is what I'm dealing with and my health, because if I'm not healthy, then nothing's going to work. And it would be very easy for me to push other things, the health, especially out of the way, but you have to recognize that that is really a core piece doesn't mean you've got to go run a marathon, but it means that you've got to take care of yourself in some way and refill your tank. So the way we recommend really coping with this time is knowing that it is not permanent, knowing that you need to be flexible. Jacqueline, I loved when you said the sway, work-life sway, like that's exactly what it's about. You need to be able to kind of just go with the flow as much as you can but still having your priorities in place so that you just know how to recalibrate. Thanks. And Ishwan, would you like to take that question as well? Yeah, and it's so funny that Mimi brought up, you can have it all, but not all at once. That was something that I keep hearing over and over early on in my career. And I have to frankly tell you, it never sat well with me. You know, I realized that if I follow that advice, I would never be able to raise amazing children hang with my parents, be a great leader, reach my full potential at work, and also pursue all my passions before I die. So my mission with Apiary is to help families live a sweet life. And part of that has been personally learning to understand what must be done, does it need to be done by me? And if not, who is best suited to help? And I actually shared a post with the Fairy God Boss team here that I wrote about how to build your support team at home so that you can get it all done without having to do it all. And the key takeaway, if you don't bother to read the blog, that's totally fine, is to remember to delegate the task to someone who can free up that mind share that allows you to fully dive into the things that you need to be fully present for. That is great advice. And that's actually something I'm trying to teach my mother <laughs> because she wants to do it all, right? But impossible. And we learn um, from people before us, right? And I think it's our role as the next generation to teach the future generations what needs to be done. So for your daughter as well. Yes, definitely. So um, related to this last question, how are you managing stress? Mimi, do you wanna take this question? Sure, so it's, being really clear on what does light you up and what excites you and, and making sure that you have space for that, even if it's a little bit. So I alluded before I said, you know, health is really has to be important. So the first thing is not to overwhelm yourself with some kind of health goal. Like, you know, maybe this is not the time to go on keto or it's not the time to do a triathlon. I did that when I was in my thirties. It was fun. I'm not doing it now, you know? Um, so it's about figuring out like, what is, what lights you up in, by way of your health? You know, do you like yoga? Do you like to run? Do you like to do weights? How do you decompress? And then finding space to do a little bit of it every single day or several times a week. So that's the first piece. And then the second piece is what really truly lights you up just from a, Hey, this makes me happy perspective. And maybe that's reading or watching 
you know, there's a, a series on Netflix that you really enjoy or you love to shop or, you know, what are those things that you love to do and make sure that you have the space for that as well, because it's important and it's what will refill your tank. Thanks. And uh, Jackie, did you want to answer that as well? Sure. Thanks, Lisa. To me, I think the thing that helped me manage my stress or continues is to get a better relationship with stress. I think for so many of us, we, um, we feel stressed and then we accelerate that by saying, oh my gosh, I'm so stressed. I'm so busy. Oh my goodness. I have so much to do. And oftentimes the stress that we feel is actually internal. So one of the things that I love to do is to really take a look at like, what's giving me stress? And is this something that I can control? Is it something out of my control? Or is it something that honestly, I'm perpetuating because I'm getting anxious about it or because I'm saying I'm busy. So instead of um, the physical, which I do do, I do meditation, I do box breathing, I do definitely do things like that. But I want to change that stress habit. And we as humans, our brain gets addicted to stress. A lot of everything Mimi and I teach is based in brain science and energy. So when you are addicted to stress, even non-stressful situations, our brains will search for a stress trigger because we want that addiction to cortisol. So the more we can really get a better relationship with stress, the more we can actually attack it from the root as opposed to try to find some physical things that will just take care of you in the moment. That's great. I feel like I'm going to have to have my mom watch the replay of this because I think she would learn a lot <laughs> and she's beyond a boomer. So she's the greatest generation. Um, Barbara, you alluded, you um, alluded to this in the, um, in your intro, maybe you could tell us a little bit about a specific challenge you faced as a woman trying to find her footing in her career and how you overcame that. Yeah, and, and really quickly, I think Lupe wanted to throw something oh. in really quickly about that. Sure, sure. You know, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. And so one thing was, you know, I loved what Mimi and Jackie said. And I think what, you know, one thing that happens is that we just don't create the, the system in our calendar sometimes to actually a lot of the time to do what we need to do. Um, we set up meetings that we set up, you know, appointments in our calendar and those take priority and oftentimes bump the times when we should be setting aside time for ourselves. So what I have started to incorporate into my calendar is like blocks within every hour of like five minutes, get up. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, just a matter of detaching from the computer even for five minutes over the course of a day, um, and then maybe even blocking in a, a small walk or whatever it might be, but it's the idea of physically putting it into your calendar and making sure that it's non-negotiable so that you don't book appointments over it. And you stay true. I think that also helps to kind of just keep, uh, keep you honest and on track to hopefully working towards reducing your stress. So yeah, and, and, and Lisa, what was your question again, my dear? The challenge. Sorry, it was... Um... It was about overcoming a career challenge and, and what you did yeah. about it. And you kind of alluded to that in your intro. So we want to make sure we get to that. Yes. So having been in corporate America for um, just over 20 years prior to becoming an entrepreneur in 2011, um, you know, some of the challenges that I faced was I was in two separate, very different industries with different challenges. So I was in the shopping center industry with a very large developer. For those of you that are in Indiana, Simon Property Group and General Growth out of Chicago. And while I was in an industry that was filled with women and men, a good, a good mix, um, you know, that was the industry that I saw myself retiring in. Only I, like some of us, get to a point even in our 30s where you get burned out. So I made the mistake when I looked back, when I got my uh, into the radio career, I looked back and saw that um, there wasn't a challenge at the time, but I, I didn't challenge myself enough to stay with it. And so um, I left that I left that industry being burned out and went into an entirely different industry that was male dominated, where it was not where where then the sexism prevailed, where we were not heard, uh, we weren't um, uh, you know we were not uh, the women were cutthroat sadly um, because it was so male dominated, and so my challenge 
is that I took on another career that I, I, I sort of liked, but that I didn't like because of what, um, how cutthroat it was and how, um, how we were, ageism was starting to prevail. Again, this is media. And so ageism was prevailing. You were not valued. And even with the clients, when you're working, walking in as a woman and you are walking it, especially with me at 5'11 and high heels at four inch high heels, I'm towering over you know people, and I have a big voice. So you know, so the challenge really was, I had to at times, and I wonder how many people have had to even downplay their personality and who they were, and who they are, and how we came across. So there was a lot of challenge in me being me and me being able to voice who I was as a strong woman. Although I wasn't feeling so strong because of all of the sexism and the, the things that were put in, on us. And so then I went back into, my, into the model industry and guess what? I, after being in that industry, experienced um, the, experienced um, imposter syndrome and lack of confidence because I'd been out of it for so long and I had a very difficult time with a female boss. And sadly, um, you know, I, I lost that position. And so the challenge was me trying to come back and figure out what my own value is. And this is where I wanna, I wanna leave this with, what is your value? Because I had been a success, even though I faced certain challenges, I had been a success but I didn't feel successful when I lost my position. And I think that's what happens is the lack of confidence and we start putting that on ourselves and the imposter syndrome is real and the lack of feeling that your skills that you have once brought to a corporation are no longer valid, but they are, they are. And I took a personal audit. It took time, but I took a, a personal audit of what I, what my hard skills and soft skills are. And that's why I impress upon the women. And that's one of the things that we're going to, we want to impress upon you is take an audit of who you are, what you bring to your company right now. They've hired you to build their company. Sometimes we forget that and we forget our own value. That is great advice. Great advice. I think everyone here can relate to that. Jackie, you, did you want to answer this question as well? Oh, I would love to. And I have to tell you, Barbara, I wear my high heels and I am not even close to my heels to 5'11". So I am jealous of your stature and your height it comes coming in from the five foot four woman um, pre heels. So I, I, I thought about this question. We were talking about the, you know, the troubles, the challenges we have between career and life. And my example actually fits into this conversation perfectly because I was on track to be publisher. I was at a major media company at age, the brand, and I was on track to be publisher. And I had always had that goalpost. Like I wanted to be publisher. I knew what I wanted. And when I was about a year and a half away from getting there, my dad had gotten very sick. It's been eight years and I'm going to try not to cry, but it's real, right? My dad had gotten very sick. My daughter was three. My, my job was in Manhattan. And for anyone who's not from the area, it's about a two hour commute one way. And I wore it all on my shoulders and I showed up at work every day I could. I worked from the hospital once a week. I would go to the hospital after work. I would go to the hospital weekends. I tried to sneak in time with my daughter. And that challenging time made, it was so hard for me to realize that it wasn't, I couldn't be all in the same way. And I had to give myself permission to adjust the expectations I had always had for myself. And the reason why I wanted to bring that point up is I believe why women struggle most during COVID is we haven't adjusted our expectations. We expect to show up at work the same exact way. We expect to be moms the same exact way. We expect our house to look as clean when you have seven humans and dogs in here all the time that they aren't going off, right? So these expectations we put upon ourselves and ladies, most of the time they're not put upon us by any external forces. So I wanted to share this story. I'm gonna get emotional because it's part of my vulnerability and who I honestly am. 
But I want you guys to give yourself permission to change those expectations so they work for you. They work for you and where you are in your life right now. You don't have to be the uber high achiever at work or you don't have to be the uber teacher at home, right? To, to, um, to the point before, Ish, Ishan, um, Ishwan, sorry, I wanted to say your name correctly. I needed a moment to the point before where you need to really delegate, but you also need to change those expectations because maybe you can't afford to delegate and that's okay. So we want to make sure that you guys really um, give yourself permission to, to change those expectations. That is all. Hey, hey, don't don't put the pressure on yourself um, to think that you need to find your purpose and your passion right now. Uh, it, it, it takes time to really, uh, and I, a lot of our women say to us, and I, I'm sure Jackie and, um, and Mimi and everyone on here will agree, they're trying to find that what next. They're trying to find that thing they want to do when they grow up, and they're stuck. Many of us have been stuck before. All of us have on this call have been stuck before. But don't put that pressure on yourself to feel like you absolutely have to find it right now. What is my passion? No, you need to do work within yourself and just enjoy life. Just enjoy this number you're sitting at. Enjoy the chapter number, as we say. Don't put that pressure on you, on you that you have to be and do. We've had enough pressure on ourselves as women, whether you have kids or not have kids and just have dogs, or whether you, you're in a career that you want to pivot, you want to swivel and create something new in your life. Don't put that pressure that you must find your purpose in life. It will come to you. It will be guttural. And if it doesn't, it's okay. Do life. Do you. That is awesome. I These are great stories. Before I move on to the next question, I just want to make sure that uh, Jacqueline, Mimi, or Ishwan don't have anything they want to add to this. Well, I love, you know, what Jackie was saying about, you know, everyone's bringing something to the table and everyone's bringing their situation with them. So, I mean, the biggest thing, and I know we'll talk about it a little bit later, was when you're interacting with people, whether it's above you, below you, at your level, have empathy. Give people, like, they might not be ready to share what's going on in their life. So just, you know, approaching people as humans. Everyone is a human. Everyone's got something going on, whether, like, just like uh, Barbara just said, whether they have kids or they don't have kids or they're supporting their parents or they're not. They don't have to tell you, but be ready to support them in whatever ways they need. Jacqueline, I'm so happy that you said that be human first. That's something Jackie and I talk about all the time that you need to take a human first approach. And I think if this pandemic has taught us anything, it's exactly that we don't know who's got what like going on and maybe they're just not ready to share it or they are uncomfortable sharing it or they can't. Just give people the grace and the space that they need more than ever, because it's been, it's been a time for so, for so many, I, for all of us. And so giving people that space and giving yourself that space, it's just, that's, you know, what we can do. Yeah. And you're right. On the flip side of that, if you have something going on and you need help, ask for it, find a way to talk to someone, bounce ideas off of how might I approach the situation? Don't hold it all in, right? We, we all have something going on. So, you know, it's both sides of the coin. So, yeah. I think that's the problem that we have, right? Is that we, we feel like we're being vulnerable. We don't want to feel vulnerable by asking for help. There are so many of us that feel as though asking for help is a weakness and it's not. Yeah. Or you feel like a oh. failure or it's, it's the idea of sense of a failure, yeah. That, you know, to I think it was Jackie's comment, this idea that we should be able to do it all. Um, it's not possible. So there is no failure associated. There is no shame. In fact, if you ask for help, imagine what more you could do and how much more you could accomplish if you actually created a community in effort to support you and move things forward versus sinking, swallowing, and then on top of that, then you know, get, get, turning inward and not feeling good about yourself. So it's a win-win when we all take stock of what we can do and seek the help that we need to move us forward with things that we can't handle. And, and it's, it, yeah, and Jackie and Mimi have a wonderful community. We have a community. Join, like she said, join uh, the believers and achievers. Surround yourself with people that are believers and achievers. That will help you, but do ask 
for help. Absolutely. Trust me, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Well, I, I have to agree, that is a very important thing to do. Great advice here from everyone. So the next question is, what do you think is the biggest challenge that women in the workforce are facing today? I know that we're facing a lot of challenges, but what do you think is the biggest one and what do you think we could do to fix that? And how about if we go first to uh, Barbara? Yeah, you know, the biggest challenge that women are facing is ageism. Is um, you know that's where where we're focused on helping women in uh, in fighting against um, the the idea that they are over, the idea that they are invisible, the idea that their skills aren't enough, and we're being pushed out in droves. In droves, Gen X and Boomers are being pushed out, and the pandemic pushed that. Um, <laughs> it's called the she session for a reason. And so what's happening is we're being devalued yet the skills that you do bring when you take an audit of what you bring, as I said uh, a little bit ago, I want you when you leave this this call today, I want you to write down every single asset that you bring, because even though you work for a company, you're bringing, as I said a moment ago, assets. They hired you to move the needle, but they're not recognizing that. And so you need to have, uh, you need to take on a growth mindset versus the fixed mindset that what you're doing now is enough. Sadly, it may not be. And sadly, we have to remain, uh, we have to continually um, keep ourselves abreast of what's what's hot, what's new, new techs. You know, get out there and get the skill sets. If you want to learn something new, even if it's not in your industry, learn it, but also let people know. And, and, and there's no shame in bragging about what tools you have assessed, uh, I'm sorry, that you have uh, obtained in, in you know, taking a certification class or a new Coursera class or Skillshare. You know, just stay, um, I hate to say this, but stay relevant if you can and showcase those skills and those assets because the challenge is they think that we're over and that we don't know tech, that we don't know, but we do know. But you have to make it known. You have to make it known. And we're not, we're not built or we weren't, you know, we were told bragging was not something women should do. But you need to do it in your workplace if you want to remain there. And if that's not the place you want you want to be, get those skills and skill up. Um, so I just want to say there are some great questions in the Q&A from the audience, and we will get to those. I just have uh, two more questions for the panelists, and then I promise we will get to the Q&A questions. So um, what do you think companies can and should do to help their sandwich generation employees? And feel free to share any examples you might have, any calls to action, any resources, any tools. And let's go to Jacqueline first. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that the top things that any company or leader can do would be to listen, support, and engage. So listen to what people need. How are they struggling? You know, try things out. Don't be afraid to try a pilot out, see if it works, get people's feedback, and then either extend it or stop it. Um, support folks throughout their whole journeys. As we've talked about, everyone's in their own situation. Understanding some journeys might be, you know, a year and two years long if, if someone, you know, gets sick for a really long time and, and it's a long-term support that they need. Um, engage other leaders as well. So even if they're not involved, right, but make sure that the managers of these people know how to handle, how to handle these discussions, how to help their people, what resources are out there. Uh, you know, at Accenture, we've launched a lot of uh, new benefits this year, as well as some old ones that we've had. Bright Horizons, it has um, backup adult, elder, and child care, family care resources, um, situational assessments for elder care. Uh, you know, our employee assistance program goes through financial and retirement planning, housing support, Medicaid, transportation, all of that. Um, there's a, a new digital solution called Sundial that helps uh, keep elderly connected to their family, their whole village. Uh, there's a wealth, wealthy family concierge, which kind of helps with appointments, prescriptions, 
you know, insurance, vaccinations, things like that. So, you know, what a lot of these resources, one of our biggest challenges is we're a really huge company. So you have to put out enough resources that do cover everyone's different situations and, and try, uh, you know, but again, it's, it's try things, see how they work, change, flex, and continue to sway. I think that's my, my, my big uh, theme for the day. So. I like that a lot, life balance way. I think that's a great way of looking at it. Um, Iswan, I think you had some tips you wanted to share. Yeah, so in terms of companies thinking about how to help this generation, the sandwich generation, I really think they should be thinking along three main axes to help reduce the burden of care, which is cost, time, and support. So in terms of um, you know, cost, exceptional care is expensive but it really allows, like I said, employees to be fully present. So companies should really think about how the company can reduce that caregiving expense. And it could be as simple as making sure that there is a depending care flexible spending account, which by the way, Congress recently expanded the program to allow employees to contribute up to $10,500 of pre-tax dollars that can go to subsidized care. The second one on time is that, you know, I found many companies pay for employees monthly membership to like a care.com or an urban sitter, which is all great. But oftentimes those employees are left with the time burden of having to sort through hundreds of profiles, the vetting, the coordinating of the care that they need. And that can eat up 20 hours of the time. So not so great as a resource when you're looking for backup care that's happening, you know, this afternoon, or if you need a couple of hours of help next week. Um, so I think companies should really be mindful about the, the benefits that they provide that really fits you know, along the whole spectrum. And lastly, in terms of support, companies really need to think more broadly between childcare and elder care. You know, so often we say, oh, we have parents, so they need childcare. Oh, somebody has an older parent, they need elder care. That's just a bookend. There's like a lot of messy stuff in between, right? So, you know, I'll share this best with a story. Um, you know, when Michelle Obama was going on the campaign trail, she had two young children and an elderly parent. And I'm going to put my panelists on the spot and ask, what does she need most that give her the confidence to fully dive into the campaign trail? Do you guys remember what she hired or who she hired? She actually hired a chef. She realized that what she needed the most and where she thought she was failing her family was making sure that they had a healthy meal and that they were eating great. She started to see that they were trading in home cooked meals for you know, pizzas and you know, takeaways. And that didn't sit well with her. And she really had a hard time pulling away from her family, right? So again, not always childcare, not always elder care, but what can give us that free up that mind share that is causing us that mental load. And that's really where we need to start thinking about. That's great. Um, Guadalupe, would you like to add something? Yeah, you know, I, I love all the answers and y'all were like, definitely we're thinking the same thing here because I was like, oh, they're seeing all these wonderful <laughs> answers. You know, I, I feel like the, what I would also propose is is having, we were talking earlier about human connection. So take the time to talk to your people and understand what they need right now. The needs, as I think Jacqueline was mentioning, are so diverse that understanding, hey, you know, what about hiring services? Like we've got a good friend who just launched a company during COVID because many women were struggling cooking, you know, grocery shopping, running errands. It's called Call Emmy. And it was, the, it was around this concept of, let me take some of the burden off of these busy parents because we know they've got a whole bunch of things to do. But instead of telling them, you're going to have childcare, you're going to have this, and it like creating those buckets for them, it's the flexibility to let them choose. So perhaps investing and buying hours towards services like this company that I mentioned, where then the person, the employee can go in and pick whatever they need. Do I need a chef? Do I need a nanny today? Do I need someone to walk my dog? Whatever it might be, but the idea being that it can be customized to meet the specific needs of the employee. I think also another key important thing is, is to understand and work a flexible schedule. We talked about also, you know, perhaps are there, are there job share opportunities that you could offer where you could create, you know, one position, but create it in two separate ways so that maybe, you know, if they need to take care of their parent during the day, but at night they've got a nurse that comes in, well, then maybe it's switching the hours that they work. Um, being just mindful that it's not for lack of not wanting to show up to work. It's a matter of just how can I meet you in the middle? So it really comes down to just being empathetic and understanding that 
we're, we're all going to be in this position at one point in time where we have to care for our parents. Aging is part of life. So put yourself in their shoes right now and say, what can I do to ease the burden? Where can I, where can I lift a little bit so that they have a little bit of peace of mind and can focus on the important task of taking care of their parent? You know, in caregiving, uh, you know, I mentioned I don't have kids, but it's also on both sides. We're talking about the sandwich because you all are taking care of your younger ones and your older ones. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like? I'm curious what some of you would say, you know, you've got the high schoolers, the, co the college students are already gone, but the junior high schoolers, I mean, you know, people are still having babies in their forties. And so what are they doing to balance the two? I'm curious about that. Yeah. My college student might be gone, but we still support her. We still, you know, she still texts us all the time asking questions and we still have to go move her and we still want to be there for her. So it doesn't ever really go away, you know? Anyone yeah. else have anything to Yeah, I, I did want to piggyback on something. Uh, you know, when we talk about what it is, tangible things that you can do, one of the biggest things for me is building a network. And so as a company, helping enable this people to connect and share and collaborate. And then as an individual, finding other people who've been through a similar situation, because also they're the best ones to work for. They're the ones that are gonna be the most understanding. So the more you can connect people and they can share about resources they've used and also find what they need when they need it, right? We're talking about all these different benefits. Well, last January versus today and what I need are very different. So making those accessible and, and sharing that and, and helping people just build this network of just support to keep us all going. And, you know, as we talked about earlier, we're all in this together and we've all got stuff going on. So how can we kind of continue that conversation? Mimi, did you have something you wanted to share? I just wanted to say that companies really just need to offer flexibility. I remember when I was working my corporate job, I had wanted so badly to work from home one day a week, and that was out of the question. And I finally got it because I lobbied for it, but it wasn't an overnight kind of thing. And there is no way I would be able to take care of my, my father in the state had I not had the kind of flexibility that I have now. So just plain and simple flexibility. It's a necessary more than ever, more than ever. Okay, I'm gonna to go to some of the questions because some of them are great. Um, one person asked, can you share examples about asking for help at work? How have you approached expectations as work as you're balancing work as a caregiver that is simultaneous in a pandemic setup? So um, I'm, I'm just gonna, uh, whoever can wants I answer to answer that. I would love yeah. to take that. Um, I, so I would love to, I think, couple of things when we go into the conversation, really going into the conversation with this idea that we're going to come to this conversation looking for a resolution, right? I think a lot of times we come to it like I want to win or I'm so nervous that this is a difficult conversation or conflict and just going into the conversation thinking, okay, we need to come to a resolution. I need a resolution. And then when you go to the conversation to have that conversation, you want to, you want to kind of put your what we call the negotiation container together. So what's at the top of the container? I would love to have five days a week working from home, right? What, what do you really want? What are you willing to accept uh, two days a week working from home? And so you have this container to go in with. So you have a negotiation point and then also bringing the benefits that you will, that this will do for you and for the organization. As much as we wanna to say the to human first approach, and I believe in it wholeheartedly, your boss may be worrying about who's gonna get your job done, right? So instead, so we need to also be able to bring those tangible, by doing this, I may not be in the office for you know, nine to five, or I may not be available nine to five. However, these projects will get done, they'll get done timely, and I'll be more, and you'll have fewer mistakes because I won't be stressing about having to work at this time. I'll have flex, whatever that looks like, but being very clear with the benefits when you're going in for that conversation. So, you know, what's in your negotiation container? So what is the highest end you want? What is the lowest end that you would accept in this resolution? And then adding to that, this whole idea that you really want to um, 
to kind of own your worth and show the benefits. Yeah, and I would love to just add also to understand where your strengths lie. We all have certain areas where, you know, we can whip out, for example, writing is a really strong suit for me. So I can whip out a release or a written piece of docu a document in like a snap. You put me on something else that maybe is not in my current wheelhouse and it will take me a lot longer. So are there understanding like what contributions, where the strengths are within yourself and within your team? And is there a way to allocate and say, hey, I'll take this writing off of your plate if you take my X, Y, Z. And almost it's like a barbering system where everybody still is contributing towards the end project, but you're tapping into your skills where you know, hey, this is only gonna take me a certain amount of time and then I'm gonna have time to take care of my parent or my child. Um, um, and it's still going to be quality. So understanding, I think, taking a, an audit of that and then with, working with your team to understand where they want to focus on and how you guys can collaborate is a really great way of not necessarily asking for help, but just finding a solution to get the job done as well, too. Yeah, and I'd say when you're asking for help as well, don't just think of your village as your personal village. There's a work village. There's your team. And... <laughs> you know, sway, my, my new theme, uh, you, you sway within your team. So when I first, when, when my kids first went virtual, it was like, hey guys, my, my normal schedule isn't gonna fly. I'm gonna have to shift some things. Who can pick up this meeting? Who can pick up that meeting? Great, let me pick this other thing up for you, right? We all kind of, it was an ebb and flow. And then, you know, later in the year, uh, one of my team members, you know, they had to go to New York to take care of a, a parent. And you know, we all did that same thing. It was come together. How are we going to do this as a team, as our as our work village? So, you know, definitely expand your your team mentality to to keep you going when you need help. So I'm going to combine two questions because they're kind of like one end of the spectrum and then the other. Um, so one question. So the so there's a question about whether or not anyone has quit or left a job to be a caretaker. And then the other question was, if you have quit to be a caretaker and you've been out for over 10 years, how do you try to get back into the workforce? Because chances are, you know, most of your, con you don't have as many contacts. Who would like to, anyone? So yeah, so I, I have not left, but I can answer the latter part. Um, so through our organization, we have crossed paths with numerous companies that are working with return shifts. And these are women over 40, 50, 60 plus who, you know, prior to taking that absence, um, and, th and that absence could be whether it's for caregiving, military, health, whatever, I mean, it runs the gamut. But the idea being that you have prior experience and you had work experience that you still have, it doesn't go away just because you take a break. But what they do is they really focus in on helping you kind of, it's almost like a, like a graduate internship of sorts, but it's paid and it's still an opportunity for you to kind of freshen up skills, get back into the workforce and create a path towards a, a job. I think also another great tip, so returnships would be one. I think the other idea is taking a look at where your holes are in your resume and understanding what, what's the position you wanna go into now? And what do I need? What do I have it that already is in my arsenal and what do I need to sharpen up or level up on? Or what else do I need to add to my resume in order to apply for a new job? Right now, I feel considering the times in COVID and just all the realities that we've been going through, I think employers are a little bit more empathetic in understanding that life is happening. And so don't try to hide it, address it and say, hey, this is what happened. But I have since during this time also taken a class, I've leveled up my certification, I've done X, Y, Z, whatever it might be, showing that you're still engaged in some form or fashion, even if it's online school, shows a sense of commitment and interest in still learning, engaging, and that you can still contribute back into the position you wanna get hired in. I love that Guadalupe. And I would just add to that in that do not underestimate the skills that you have even picked up or obtained while you are on this leave because 99.99% .99 of the time you're not sailing around the world and you know drinking Mai Tais. You are doing big roll up our sleeves kinds of things. And these are skills that in some way can be positioned or packaged into 
what you want to do next. And some of them are very tangible and some of them may not be tangible, but they are even more important. And those are the emotion, emotional intelligence qualities that you have picked up along the way. So really learn how to showcase that because more than ever, like Guadalupe just said, we need to show compassion. We talked about this so many times on this panel, we need to show empathy. And you have those skills, especially if you have left to be a caretaker. So these are you know, the emotional intelligence skills that people need more than ever. So really don't underestimate that. And also weave that into your story when you're out there talking to different people and building your network and starting to interview. And then someone asked, how do you balance transitioning starting an in, in, um, entrepreneurship while working full time? And maybe because of this panel's topic, we can add in caregiving. Anyone want to? I think uh, Barbara started her own company. Maybe she'd yeah. like to take that. Oh, I was going to say, I, I don't mind uh, taking the starting quickly and then I'll pass it along. I, the one thing that I encourage if you want to start an entrepreneurial journey as you're working is to a few things. One is be very diligent and descriptive in what you want to work on every single day and every single week and plan it because it, it will fall to the wayside because we're so, um, we're just so busy, right? Or we'll use it as our downtime because it's our passion project and we can get into burnout stage that way. So be very diligent about planning and um, focusing on one thing at a time. And don't look at launching the business because sometimes we get overwhelmed, but look, at what do I need to do right now that will just move the business forward just a bit? And knowing your why. Why is it that you want to do this, your mission, and sort of creating, a, even if it's just a one-page uh, business plan, because a lot of times we start companies, even if it's a side gig, and we, we don't do the work that it really takes to create a sustainable company. Because if you're starting a company with the hopes of leaving corporate America, then you, you need to have a roadmap. So you need to have your resources in order or the idea of what you want to do, but on paper, not just up here, um, you know, in the SBA, there's a lot of organizations out there that can help you with starting that and creating, again, your business plan, and, you know, or market and or marketing strategy. I mean, you need both, quite frankly. We have about two minutes left and we want to end on a positive note. So I'm going to go around the Zoom room and have everyone say, what their greatest accomplishment is right now. Not your greatest accomplishment ever, just your accomplishment for now. And let's start with uh, Barbara and Guadalupe. I'll let you go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my greatest accomplishment is um, being the woman that I'm helping right now in Second Act. I am a, a woman at 47 and I have always struggled with imposter syndrome and finding my voice. And even speaking like this would scare the like baloney out of me. And so, <laughs> so to actually have overcome and now be in a position where I am walking alongside other women and helping other women shed those belief, those limiting beliefs and own their voice is I think my, my personal achievement so far, but this time. <laughs> mine, it, mine is, is uh, a little bit similar in that I jumped over fear and decided to go ahead and take this idea of starting this company off of uh, the shelf that it had been on for five years. Uh, and I decided to, to listen to friends and listen to myself and my gut that said it's time. And, uh, you know, in the fact that I finally said yes to doing this has been nothing but a blessing because the amount of women that we are able to tap into helping alongside helping really ourselves too, because we're still growing. Uh, you see that I'm 54 and it's just been uh, an all around blessing to have finally accomplished something and continue on this trajectory of helping so many women finally say yes to them and living their lives because we matter. We matter. And this has nothing to do with, with what happened yesterday. We all matter. You matter. Your age should not hold you back. That's the beauty of being this age 
is who we are and what we stand for and our experience and wisdom, ladies. You've got to own it. And it takes time, but you will own it and love it. Jacqueline, what about you? I think, uh, you know, over this last year, I'm just so proud of all the people I've been able to help get through this last year. Be that person that they can reach out and ping and ask questions and be the person to connect everybody and, and share the resources and ideas. And uh, I just continue and, and hope to continue to be able to do that. Um, it's, it's been a, a great kind of feeling of, of, of success this year. Mimi? I'm going to share most recently, it was being on the Today Show with Jackie. It was so much fun. And it really just showcases that anything is possible. And really just celebrating that when we as women unleash what is possible for us, we can do anything. So much fun. And uh, Jackie, do you want to follow up? Yeah, it's absolutely. Um, the Today Show was definitely one of the, I think it is the greatest accomplishment late of late. It was so much fun, but also this idea that um, you all, you can step into whoever you want to become, to Mimi's point, and don't let your imposter that we've talked about, don't let the beliefs, don't let all of these things that we hold as our truths hold us back. And your time may not be now. If you are caregiving and you're kind of slowing your pace in your career so you can manage your family, it doesn't mean you can't, you, you, that that's where you're going to stay. So just the other thing um, I just wanted to add is, is the greatest accomplishment that I want to give myself is I give myself permission. I give myself permission for whatever that looks like, for showing up the way I need to today. So giving yourself permission is another way that I feel um, we can all support each other and ourselves. Each one, what, um, what's your greatest accomplishment so far? Um, I think it's actually to just realize the full potential of working parents, not just women, but also men, um, and really being able to support them through apiary and building out what we see as a great potential for future of living. And to remind everybody that life is really sweet when we decide to say yes to a lot of things that we want to do in life. Well, thank you. Well, thank you all so much. I know we're um, here at time. I know we could probably talk for another hour. Or so, so many um, great stories and advice shared today. So I wanna give a huge thank you um, to all of our panelists, as well as to Lisa for moderating today's session. Um, again, please join us on Fairy God Boss. We are constantly sharing out advice like what we talked about today. Um, and please do check out um, all of these wonderful organizations that all of our panelists um, are contributing to. Um, so with that, we are at time. So again, thanks so much, everyone, um, and hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Mm -hmm.